Let us turn to the Word of God. This morning we're going to begin a series of studies in Paul's letter to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you have received, let him be accursed. Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from men, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and had called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and again I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to, to visit Cephas and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still not known by sight to the churches of Christ in Judea. They only heard it said, He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith he tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Few parts of the Bible have had such a profound influence on the history of the church as Paul's letter to the Galatians. And yet opinions about this little letter are sharply divided those who love this epistle and would call it their favorite and those who just don't like it at all. On the one hand, there are people like Martin Luther who said, this is my letter, I am married to it, it is my Katie. He married a nun called Catherine. And so he said, I am married to this letter, it is my wife, it is my Katie. And someone said of Martin Luther that this letter was the pebble from the brook which, with which, like another David, Luther slew the papal giant by smiting him in the forehead. John Bunyan said of Luther's commentary on this little letter that apart from the Bible, this was his favorite book. John Wesley likewise loved the letter to the Galatians and owed a great deal to it. That's the one opinion that puts the letter to the Galatians very high on the list. Indeed, Luther went so far as to say that this is the very best book in all the Bible. 
At the other end are those who call it Paul's crucifixion epistle. Others have called it a very thorny letter. And another person has said it is like a thunderstorm with every sentence a thunderbolt. Why don't some people like this letter? Why is it not popular today in the 20th century? Well, some people find it too emotional. Gets very worked up. Some of these verses were written at white heat. You can feel anger there. You can feel very deep feelings. Some people don't like that kind of disturbance. Other people find it too personal. Paul talks a lot about himself in this letter. There's a lot of autobiography bi here. And people feel that Paul is being just a little too direct here. A little too personal about people. Then there are those who don't like this letter because it's a bit too intellectual. Paul is arguing very carefully. And you've got to concentrate. You can't read this at one sitting. You can't just skip through it. Ten verses a day keeps the devil away kind of fashion. You've got to think. You've got to bring your mind to bear on it and let the argument unfold step by step. And some people just don't like to think. And some people have found this letter too spiritual. It's very deep. And those who like paddling around in the shallows of Christianity don't like this letter. It goes very deep. But I think the main reason why this letter is not liked by many Christians is that it is too controversial. It raises issues that divide professing Christians from one another. And in these days, the cry is, let's concentrate on those things we agree upon and forget the things on which we disagree. Let's come together. Let's forget our differences. Let's all be one. And that is why in ecumenical Bible studies, the letter to the Galatians is never chosen. It would divide professing Christians. It raises issues that are not dead yet and which keep us apart from each other. Is it right then to study Galatians today? Why not stick to Ephesians, which is all about unity and the things that unite us? Why go to a controversial letter? Is it right for Christians to talk about differences? My answer is yes and no. If the differences are secondary and unimportant, then we ought to forget them. But if they are primary and vital to Christianity then we are betraying the gospel of Jesus if we do not raise them. Let me give you an example. I don't think it is a hanging matter whether we use fermented or unfermented wine at communion. But there are Christians who will not take communion together because of this thing. In Easter week we will be joining with the Church of England for an evening communion service at St. Saviour's on the Thursday evening, and I will look forward to that coming together in fellowship at his table. I haven't been asked by them which sort of wine we want, but I don't think that's an issue that should divide Christians. But on the other hand, if I am told that I cannot take bread and wine unless I've had a bishop's hands on me, then I think there's a vital matter involved here. And I praise God that that has now been waived. And Paul is raising in Galatians, not secondary matters, but vital fundamental principles. He is a fundamentalist of the right kind. He goes to the heart of the matter and he says, this is the vital principle involved here. And we must get it right or we'll lose the gospel. And the gospel comes before unity. He realizes as he writes, he's going to upset people. He's going to divide professing Christians. He's going to tread on corns. But he knows that he's got to do it because he's been entrusted with something very precious, the gospel. And he must keep it intact. And in our day when the pressure is on us so much to forget our differences, the one thing we need to remember is to hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let that go and Christianity will disappear, and we shall lose our liberty in the Lord. Well, now, the best way to approach an epistle is to use the question method, how, when, where, what, why. That's what I always do when I come to a letter. Who wrote it? Where was he writing it to? When did he write it? Why did he write it? What did he write about? 
and how did he unfold the theme? And this morning, by way of introduction, I'm just going to answer those five questions. I'm not going to look at chapter one at all until next Sunday morning. First of all, who wrote it? There's no discussion about this. The answer is a man called Paul. By any standard, one of the greatest men who's ever lived. Born in a Gentile city, one of the three great university cities of the ancient world, Athens, Alexandria, and Tarsus. Born of Jewish parents, speaking the Greek language and given Roman citizenship. That's quite a start in life. Gentile, Jewish, Roman, Greek, all these cultures he inherited. And yet he didn't go to that university. His parents sent him to Jerusalem to study under Professor Gamaliel, a very wise old scholar. His parents also wisely gave him a trade and he learned to sew tents with his hands. Sometimes think that's a marvelous idea, that those who are going to use their minds for their main career should also be given a trade with their hands. I think the world would understand itself much better if all of us had a bit of both. And Paul had learned to sew the hard camel's hair canvas together for tents before he went to the university and studied under Professor Gamaliel. He became one of the most bigoted, fanatical Jews of all time. And he lived for one thing, the Ten Commandments and all the other 628 commandments that went with them. And this was his life. And he devoted his life to keeping those laws, to spreading them, and to destroying any who threatened them. And this man called Saul, named after the first king of Israel by his fond parents, lived for the law and realized straight away that the new religion started by a Jew called Jesus was the end of his religion. Realized that Christ and the law don't mix. And because of that, he devoted his whole time to throwing Christians into prison, chasing them even beyond the borders of the Holy Land so that he might destroy this faith. And then one day he met a man he thought had been dead for three years, Jesus. His whole life turned upside down. And this man with this cultural background, with this brain, and he certainly had a brain, this man with all his gifts, with all his background, with all his energy, with his unique single-mindedness, from then on was devoted to just one thing, the gospel. And now he went everywhere spreading the gospel. We don't know what he looked like except that there is one tradition that has described him as a little man, bald, with eyebrows that met across his nose, and bow-legged. Not a very attractive man to look at. Indeed, he mentions that his physical appearance was not impressive in the letter. But this little man changed the course of history through the letters he wrote. And this letter has meant more in church history than any other, perhaps. Well, now that's who wrote it. Where did he write it to? Who was the recipient of this letter? What was the address on it? Galatia. Now, it's strange, but books and books have been written by scholars as to where Galatia is. It's one of two places. It's either a little area in the middle of what we now call Turkey, or it's a larger area including that little area in what we now call Turkey. And the scholars have argued a great deal as to whether it's the little area or the big one, so let me describe them both. It's not terribly important, but it's interesting. The little area was first of all called Galatia in the year 250 BC because the king of that land needed some troops, some mercenaries, and he heard that the French were good soldiers. So he sent an SOS, come and fight for me, and I'll pay you well, and I'll give you some land of your own. And along came the Gauls. Now they were Celts. They were like the Welsh, the Irish, and the Scots. And the Spaniards you'll meet in the Basque country in northern Spain. They were Celts from France. And they came and they settled, and they fought well. They won the battle. They settled down. And so it was called Gaulatia. And if you went there, you'd meet people just like the Welsh. 
you can still meet them today. And in fact, uh, Thursday or Tuesday, Tuesday morning, I met a Spaniard from the Basque country, and yet he looked just like a Welshman. And he wasn't anything like a Spaniard to look at. He was one of these Gauls, these Celts, that spread throughout the ancient world, up and down, north and south. And so this little area was called Galatia, and they were typical Welshmen, Irishmen, Scotsmen, what have you. Now, Paul never visited them, as far as we know. And so people say, how could he write to them if he'd never known them? When the Romans came about 60 years later, they enlarged that area and they gave the name of the little area to a big area right across the middle of Turkey, almost coast to coast. And they called the whole province Galatia. And we do know that Paul went through the southern part of that belt and started churches in Antioch, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium in the south of Roman Galatia, the bigger area. And so I'm going to assume, without being dogmatic, that Paul was writing to the churches in southern Galatia, the bigger area, the Roman one. And having said that, you can see how dry it is, these questions the scholars get all excited about, and we'll forget it from now on. But I think it will help just to understand that Paul is writing to his spiritual children, whom he loves and for whom he has a deep concern, and with whom he can be cross. And he's very cross with them. He's astonished at the way they're behaving. He says, I am just amazed. I can't understand what's happened to you. And sometimes parents come to me and they say about their teenage daughter or son, I just don't understand what's got into them. I just don't understand. I'm, I'm amazed after the way I've taught them and brought them up, what's happened. And Paul is feeling the same way. He'd love to go and see them, but he can't, so out he gets his pen. You've got to have a good reason for writing a letter in those days. It was a pricey business, sending a letter, and a weary business, and it meant one man carrying it stage by stage. And he had to have a good reason for writing a letter, and he had a good reason. He couldn't go, and his children were getting into trouble. And so he wrote, and he's not the first parent who's written to youngsters, pleading with them to think what they're doing. That's how the letter to Galatians was born. When did he write it? If what I have said so far is right, this is the very first letter we have of Paul. It's the earliest. It's the beginning of his writings in correspondence. That makes it rather exciting and interesting. Why did he write it? What has gone wrong in these families of God's children whom he brought to the new birth? What's gone wrong in these assemblies at Lystra and Iconium and Derby and Antioch? What's gone wrong? Well, they're under attack, not from outside, but from inside. Not from persecution, but from perversion. And what's gone wrong is in the pulpit. You see, if things go wrong in the pulpit, it's not long before they go wrong elsewhere in the pew. And into this church have come preachers who've taken the pure, simple gospel that Paul preached and they've twisted it in a very subtle and dangerous way. So subtle that the Galatians, they're falling for it. They think it's the same gospel, the same Christianity. And my, we have the same problem today. You've got to be on your spiritual toes to understand and to see when the gospel of Christ is just being given a twist that will spoil it all. And it's happening on a wide scale today as it happened then. Now what was the twist? If the devil can't get you from outside, then he comes inside. He, he was the first to think of the principle, if you can't lick him, join him. And so he comes right inside and he twists the truth. Now what was being twisted? In a word, the preachers coming to these little churches were telling Gentile Christians that they should be Jewish Christians. That's all. They were telling them, if you're going to accept the New Testament gospel, you've got to accept the Old Testament laws. They were telling them, if you want to be like Jesus, then Jesus was a Jew and he was under the Jewish laws, and he kept the laws, and so should you. 
And this is a very subtle twist. And it started with a very simple demand. They came and they said Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was circumcised in his body. If you are a male believer, then you must be circumcised too to be like Jesus. And they were trying to turn all the Gentile Christians into Jewish Christians. And Paul had never done that. Do you notice, and this comes to one of our subjects for a few weeks' time on Sunday evening, that Paul never taught Gentile believers to observe the Jewish Sabbath. Have you ever noticed that? Not once. And he certainly never circumcised them. He taught them that a Gentile can become a Christian by going straight to Christ. They don't need to go through the Jewish channel first. And this was his gospel, Christ alone. Get straight through to him. You don't need to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. You can be a full member of the body of Christ as a Gentile believer. Hallelujah for that. Because I'm a Gentile believer this morning. And I didn't have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. Even though my Jesus is a Jew. And even though my Bible is a Jewish book. I didn't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. Now let's look at this issue because as I say that you wonder what on earth that has to do with ourselves now. It's not a problem to us or is it? Look first at this matter of circumcision. A minor operation on a man's private parts which is practiced in the Western world today out of social or medical reasons. But to the Jew it's more than that. It is first of all a racial sign. And in Germany, Hitler would identify the Jews simply by pulling their trousers down. It was a brand. It was a brand that marked them as God's people. It was more than that. It was more than a racial sign. It was a religious symbol. It was a symbol of a promise made to a man called Abraham which passed on down the line. And of that promise, circumcision was the symbol. And so to a Jew, this meant a very great deal. And it meant a great deal to Paul in his earlier days. Circumcised the eighth day, he said, I'd got everything. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But when he took the gospel to the Gentiles, he never mentioned this thing. And when he left the churches he'd founded, along came some Jewish believers and said, haven't you been circumcised yet? You've got to be. Jesus was. Now what is the issue? Is it an issue for us today? Why is it that Paul has a violent attitude to those who would do this in this letter? Let me read one verse from Galatians 5. I wish those who are so eager to cut your bodies would mutilate themselves. That's an agonizing cry of a man who's completely changed his ideas. I wish those who would cut your bodies would mutilate themselves. What a strong thing to say. That's tough language. Why does Paul feel so deeply? Because behind this simple physical act, there is a bigger issue still. And behind that, a bigger issue still. And behind that, a bigger issue still. And I just want to go through these four issues now. Behind the issue of circumcision lies the issue of Judaism. What is the exact relationship between the Jew and the Christian? between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Every one of you, as you read the Bible, has this problem. There are things ordered in the Old Testament from God to his people which you ignore. And you've got to ask why you ignore them. For example, the Old Testament forbids you to have a roast joint on Sunday for lunch. How many of you are going home to a roast joint? Let's see. Now, why aren't you worried about that? Why don't you feel guilty? Most of you are going home to break the law of God in the Old Testament. Let's look at church life, for example. In the Old Testament, it is quite clear that when people worshipped God, he wanted priests, an altar, incense, and vestments. And we haven't any of them here this morning. 
I'm not your priest. That's a table, not an altar. You can't smell incense, and I'm not wearing any vestments, and I'm not worried. Why not? Now, can you see that there's a very big issue here? What is the exact relationship? And you will find that when things like altars and vestments and incense and priests creep back into Christianity, they come from the Old Testament, which had them and which needed them. Well, now, what is the issue behind this, the relationship between Judaism and Christianity? This is not a dead issue because Christian churches are constantly being tempted to revert to Old Testament ways. Well, the issue number three behind these is the very issue of salvation. Circumcision seems unimportant, but behind it lies the issue of Judaism. Judaism, that seems well, a rather strange issue for us to discuss. It's not very relevant to us. We never even think about it. But behind that is the issue of salvation. And here's the issue. What must I do to be saved? How can I get right with God? And there is a clear difference here between those who say, this is what you have to do, and those who say, this is what the Lord will do for you. That's the issue. Faith and works, you can call it. That's the traditional one. You ask of any religion, what must I do to be saved? And see what the answer is. And people who say you must go through the rite of circumcision, you must keep the Ten Commandments, you must do this, are telling you that you must save yourself. Whereas the gospel says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. It's what he does for you, not what you do for him. And this is a totally different conception of religion. Totally different. Every religion in the world, including Judaism, says do this and live. Christianity says Jesus has done this and given you life. That's a total difference. It's the difference between works and faith. And this is the issue behind Paul's letter to the Galatians. Circumcision, behind that lies the issue of Judaism and behind that lies the religion of works. And that's a very important issue. I'm getting warmed up now, I know, but it's so important that I can't help it. Until you've got your thinking clear on the relationship between faith and works, you are in danger of losing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I think most professing Christians today would say that we are not saved by works, by good deeds, by keeping the commandments, because we can't do it. But the most dangerous development today, and I recently picked up a book written by a Baptist scholar, I'm ashamed to say, who should have known better, claiming that we could unite Protestants, Catholics, everybody today on one fundamental agreement, that we are saved by faith plus works, and that that would make us all happy and bring us all together. It's the most subtle and dangerous perversion of the gospel, and you'll find it being said on all sides today, and into that situation, Paul comes with one simple statement that it's by faith alone. Faith alone. You see, there are those who say you should do good works and get so far that way and then for the rest have faith. Get as far as you can on your own good deeds and believe for the rest. Then there are those who say believe first and then after you've believed, then try and do good works. But Paul says, listen, the life I now live, I live by faith. The gospel is from faith to faith. You don't change the basis of your relationship to Christ. You don't come to Christ on a basis of faith and then change it all to a relationship of good works. It is from faith to faith, beginning to end, by faith alone. The life I now live as a Christian, I live not by good works, but by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the issue. And it is this that we've got to get absolutely clear in our thinking if we're going to be good Christians. It is by faith. And the other side of that is that it's by grace. By grace. The key word in this letter is grace. 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 And the word grace means nothing less than God's free gift. His favor. 
And all your life, if you're going to make any progress at all in the Christian faith, it will be because you go on believing. Again and again, the verb believe in the New Testament is in a Greek tense which means a continuous activity. The Bible does not say that all you need to do is believe once and then after that, that's all. It says, those who go on believing in his name shall have life. It's a continuous relationship of faith. And that's what he's fighting. You circumcise yourself, you go back into Judaism, you go back under the law, and in fact you are going back into a relationship of works. And the life that you must live now is the life of faith in God's grace through Jesus Christ. That is revolutionary. And that's why Paul was hated by those who lived under the law. That's why he himself at once hated Christians because they turned his little religion upside down and pushed it out of the door. You can't have both. You can't mix faith and works. It's got to be faith, faith, and more faith. Of course, that faith will issue in good works. Of course it will. But faith is still the heart and the basis of the relationship. You're not trying to earn anything by being good. You're not trying to save yourself by being good. You're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ to help you to be good. That's a totally different attitude. And behind this issue of salvation lies the fourth major issue. And with this, we come right into our own daily life now. Behind circumcision is the issue of Judaism. Behind Judaism is the issue of salvation. And behind salvation, and here we come to the heart of it, is the issue of freedom. Freedom. Under the law there is no freedom. But through grace we have been set free. And it is this freedom that we must not lose. Edmund Burke said the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. That's true spiritually. Winston Churchill, writing volume 5 of the history of World War II, subtitled that volume with these words, How the Great Democracies Triumphed and Thus Were Able to Resume the Follies Which Had So Nearly Cost Them Their Lives. What a Churchillian sentence, but what a truth you can lose your freedom so easily. Christ set you free. And Paul is saying to these Galatians, you're losing your freedom. You're going to go back into bondage. You're going to lose the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. Don't. I want my spiritual children to be free. Well, now, how do you lose your freedom? And with this, we come to the last few moments this morning. There are two ways of losing your liberty. Legalism and license. Legalism and license. Legalism will put you in bondage to the law. License will put you in bondage to the flesh. And both are enemies of liberty. I remember climbing Helvellyn once, and at the very top we looked down on Striding Edge. Have you seen Striding Edge? That very narrow knife-like path going along the top of that splinter of rock. It's been formed by two huge ice balls in the Ice Age revolving and hollowing out two big corries either side. And it's left this knife edge in between. And you can walk right along its striding edge in the Lake District. And deep down in the corries you can look down and see down in the shadows sometimes the sun just catches the top of striding edge and the two corries are black and dark. And down in the bottom you can see swamp and water and rocks. And as you walk along the striding edge, with the sun beating on you and the, and the wind blowing in your face, you feel free. But either side of that freedom are the deep, dark quarries. Use that as a picture now. And Paul is saying, Christ set you free to walk in freedom with your feet firmly on the rock of faith in Christ with your nostrils breathing the air of the freedom of the Spirit, looking up and enjoying the sunshine of the favor of God. That's how you were meant to be. But the danger is that you could fall off either way, either into legalism or into license, 
either into a cage with chains here, which we call legalism, or into a swamp of mud and filth here, which we call license. Either into bondage to the law or in bondage to the flesh. And Christ set you free. How do you lose your freedom? On the one hand, by going back under the law. It's a miserable business. Substituting a relationship with Christ for regulations and rules. Thank God the Lord didn't give us a book of rules that answers every situation. Otherwise, all we'd need would be a book. The principles of Christ without the presence of Christ are a perversion of Christianity. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just to do what he said without him is bondage. You're under rules and regulations. It's impersonal. Christ offered us freedom in himself and said, I will walk with you. I'm not just going to give you rules and regulations. I'm giving you myself. And together we'll walk. But to go back under rules and regulations, even to be circumcised, says Paul, is to put the first link of a chain that will lead you into slavery again. Don't go back into the kind of bondage that the law produces. But as soon as you say that, you know, somebody misinterprets and somebody says, oh, it doesn't matter what we do then, then I'm free to do as I like. In fact, I think I'll do all, all the wrong things I've wanted to do. It'll give God more chance to forgive me. Let us sin that grace may abound. That's an attitude we call antinomianism, which means against the law. You see, the unredeemed human mind can only think of two alternatives, either having laws or having none. And so they slip down the other precipice into the swamp of flesh and they think that freedom is to do what you like. And believe me, it's not. It's the worst slavery of all. You become a slave to yourself and that's real bondage. And so Paul says, look, neither legalism nor license, but liberty, true freedom. And you know, this is the biggest concern of the human race at the moment. I find that everywhere I look and everywhere I, I read, I see that people are asking, how can we be free? Isn't that the concern of the age? How can I get free? How can I escape? How can I find liberty? And so we're marching for freedom. We're singing for freedom. We're fighting for freedom. We want to be free. And Paul's letter to the Galatians is all about freedom. It tells you what real freedom is. And the real free man is the real Christian who's living his life by faith in the Lord Jesus. So I want to give you now the outline of Galatians. And I want you to read it at home before next Sunday if you can. Chapters 1 to 2, liberty. Chapters 3 to 4, legalism. Chapters 5 to 6, license. Now could anything be simpler? That's what it's on about. That's what it's all about. One to two, true liberty. Finishing with a magnificent statement at the end of chapter two about real freedom. Chapters three to four, the danger of legalism, of coming back under the law. Chapters five to six, the danger of license, of abusing your freedom and finishing back in bondage. It's all about freedom. The best title I have ever seen for Paul's letter to the Galatians is a title given to it by an American scholar who has meant perhaps more to me than any other writer that I've met or read, Dr. Merrill Tenney. And he calls this letter the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. The Magna Carta of Christian liberty. Do you want to be free? Really free? Then study with me Paul's letter to the Galatians over the next few Sunday mornings. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus sets us free. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. But, Lord, we confess that it's so easy to lose that freedom either way. And we pray that you'll help us.
during these Sunday mornings to understand how to keep our freedom. How to be really free from the law and from the flesh. Free to walk in the spirit, looking up into the sunshine of your grace. Striding along as those who can lift up their heads and lift up their hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 457. We're going to sing a hymn written by Martin Luther and the music by Martin Luther too, the man who really set people free 350 years ago by reading Paul's letter to the Galatians. 457. Out of the depths I cry to thee, Lord, hear me, I implore thee. Bend down thy gracious ear to me, regard my prayer before thee. And he finishes up, our kind and faithful shepherd he, who shall at last set Israel free from all their sin and sorrow. 457. <laughs> 